Now that we're familiar with the antiplatelet activity of our drugs, let's move into the coagulation cascade. As we talked about, the first response is vasoconstriction, then platelet plugging, and then third would be the clot formation, and that's what we'll talk about now. We have a number of coagulation factors that are made throughout the body. The majority of these factors are made within the liver. Specifically, we have factors 1, 2, 7, 9, 10, 11, and 12, as well as proteins C and S are all made in the liver. There are a few factors that are made outside of the liver, and we know that factor 13 is made within the platelets, which sounds like that might play a part in bringing everything together, as well as we have factors 5 and factors 8 made in the endothelial lining cells, which is where the injury is occurring. This list is not for you to memorize, however, you'll notice that there are some factors that are highlighted. That is because we have very specific drugs that block the formation of these factors, in which case it's important to understand their half-life. But this is a list of all of the different numeral factors as well as their common name. You should recall from P1 year that we have fibrinogen 1A or 1 that is activated to fibrin, which is 1A. We have prothrombin, which is 2, which is activated to our main regulator, thrombin 2A. We had tissue factor, which we know goes into the extrinsic pathway. And then we can kind of skip down and see that we don't, we're not as familiar with the common names of many of the other factors until we get to the end where we see von Willebrand factor and that looks familiar again. You'll notice on the far right here that we have grouping and all of the ones that are highlighted are vitamin K dependent. That is pretty important as we talk about our drug therapy that blocks vitamin K activation, which is our warfarin therapy. So here we see that beautiful cascade that was presented in your P1 year, and hopefully you can recall with fond memories your human cascade and who played a part in what process of this clotting cascade. At the beginning, we see prechylocrine going to calocrine, 12 to 12A, 11 to 11A, 9 to 9A, 8A coming in from the side, which is self-activatable. That goes on to activate the common pathway, which begins with 10 to 10A. 5A is combined with 10A and calcium to activate prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin activates fibrin to fibrinogen to fibrin. And then 13A will cross-link that fibrin into a solid clot. If we go through the extrinsic pathway, that is a one-step process down to the common pathway where tissue factor is released from that subendothelial matrix. It binds to self-activated 7A and then activates 10 to 10A and going on to form a cross-linked fibrin strand. The clotting cascade has multiple steps of regulation in order to maintain hemostasis. Thrombin, however, plays a part in nearly every step of the process, whether it's platelet plugging, coagulation cascade, or fibrinolysis, thrombin is part of every step. So in low concentrations, thrombin will further potentiate the activation of self-activatable factors 5, 7, 8, and 13, as well as further activation of factor 11. And then we have factor 10A, which can directly activate 7 to 7A, uh, which is a one-step process, thereby potentiating the extrinsic to common pathway. When we talk about the inhibition of the cascade, here again, thrombin plays a part, but it's in opposition. So in high concentrations, thrombin will bind to thrombomodulin. That thrombomodulin will activate protein C in the presence of protein S and calcium to form the activated protein C complex, commonly referred to as the APC complex. That APC complex will then bind to factors 5A and 8A, rendering those sections of the cascade inactive. Our last regulation process is antithrombin-3. Antithrombin-3 is a serpent that is free circulating in our blood formed in the liver. This will irreversibly bind to factors 2A, 9A, 10A, 11A, and 12A. 
So if you look back at the cascade, that is all the way through the intrinsic and common pathways following that skeletal main uh, lineage of the clotting cascade. I have bolded here factors 2A and 10A since we have a few drugs that are specific as antithrombin potentiators that have activity against either 2A or 10A or one or the other. We do have endogenous heparins that are in our body free circulating that these antithrombin, uh, that the antithrombin can be potentiated with. But in this case, since we are pharmacists, we are most familiar with the heparin that we administer as an anticoagulant, which then can go on and potentiate antithrombin, thereby blocking some or all of these factors. In pictorial form, here we see thrombin in low concentration. So thrombin in low concentration will potentiate the activation of factors 5A here, 7A up there. We have factors 8 to 8A and factor 11 to 11A up at the top. We also get activation of factor 13 to 13A, which is the last step in the cross-linking of that fibrin. In inhibition, we have three systems that you're familiar with. We have our antithrombin listed here. We also have thrombin that is binding to thrombomodulin. Thrombomodulin activates protein C in the presence of protein S and calcium to form that APC complex. That APC complex will go to block, bind to factors 5A and 8A, blocking those sections of the cascade. Finally, we did talk about this last year. You won't be held responsible for it this year, but this would be your LACI. So LACI is blocking that extrinsic complex, the five or the 7A tissue factor complex.